Hey everybody, this video is about pricing and pricing is really important to any size business. This is actually an episode from my podcast, Making Waves at Sea Level, where I interview pricing expert, Mark Stiving. Now, this is about a 30 minute interview, but you wanna watch it all the way to the end because the advice he gives in the last few minutes is epic, it's powerful, and it's gonna help you do better, sell more, and make more money. So make sure you watch this. And if you like it, go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Hey there, and welcome to Making Waves at Sea Level. I started this podcast seven years ago, and we're still going strong with now almost 700 episodes. And today, we're going to talk about the ever-important topic of pricing. And my guest is Mark Stiving. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Tom, it's going to be great. Hey, leading up front, I got a question for everybody. I just started doing this a few episodes ago. What is the number one trait that you think exists amongst successful business executives? Fabulous question. And I'm going to tell you the answer is actually relevant to the topic we're going to talk about a lot today. And that is, I don't think business people think about the customer enough. And we're going to spend a ton of time talking about customer perceived value and what that means. And customer perceived value should drive almost all of your business. Ooh, I like that. That's going to be a lot of fun. So before we get started with today's episode, I have to thank the first sponsor. So today's episode is brought to you by Stanton Chase International, one of the leading global executive search firms serving as trusted advisors to help companies build their senior leadership team. You can find more at stantonchase.com or reach out to me directly because I work with Stanton Chase. All right. So for those of you who don't know Mark Stiving, Mark is a pricing expert and he helps companies win more business at higher prices. Now think about that. Which of you listening think, nah, I don't want to win more business. And when I do, I want lower prices. Everybody wants to win more business at higher prices. And Mark is the expert on that. He also likes to fly airplanes and owns two planes. That's two more planes than I own. So Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tom. I'm sorry, I wasn't trying to make you jealous. <laughs> so I, I never did pursue it, but for a couple of years, I really was interested in getting my pilot's license. I, I have a friend who has a pilot's license, and uh, I think that would be a lot of fun, but it's, it's a lot of work. It is a ton of work. It turns out that I was an adrenaline junkie most of my life. And after getting hurt enough and being old enough, I said, I think I'm going to learn how to fly airplanes. <laughs> Awesome. Why not? Hey, that, that, all, that all sounds good. That and helping people correctly price. And I don't care what your product or your service is, figuring out the right way to price yourself is really important and making sure that the customer understands that that price is tied to value. So how did you get into this line of work? Picture me at 12 years old, going to the grocery store with my mom. I would see prices that ended in nine, you know, 69, 99. And I always wondered why do companies do that? Do they think we're stupid? Right? I know 99 is really a dollar and everybody else does too. So what's the big deal? 20 years later, I found myself at a doctoral program at UC Berkeley and I'm playing with scanner panel data. Now this is the data the grocery stores collect when you use your loyalty card. We know so much about you when you do that, right? So we know what you bought, what you didn't buy, what the price was, if it was on an end, end cap, uh, uh, advertised that week in the newspaper. We know tons of stuff. And I was able to statistically figure out whether nines work or not. Turns out they do. And it works because we are lazy subtractors. But I became addicted to trying to understand how people use prices to make decisions. And I've pretty much been focused on that ever since that point. Wow. So, I mean, that's super important for all types of companies. And you talk a lot about value-based pricing. But I mean, we hear that a lot, but what is value-based pricing? What do you even mean? I, I love the way you phrase the question. We hear that a lot. And everybody says those words, value-based pricing, and no one actually knows what it means. So here it is, magic definition, charge what your customers are willing to pay. <laughs> it's that simple. Now, really easy definition. You, you, you went to a graduate program to figure that out. Good job, Mark. I know. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> but but it's impossible to do. It's impossible to do perfectly because there's no way I can read your mind and know much how much you're willing to pay. And in fact, even if I could read your mind, you probably don't even know how much you're willing to pay. So it's impossible to do perfectly, 
but the attitude, the goal is always, how do I get closer and closer to what you're willing to pay? Now that's such an important definition, by the way, because what it implies is I don't really care about the cost. Most companies who do pricing do cost plus pricing. What's it gonna cost me to do this? I want my 10% or my 20% or my 50 points of margin, whatever it's gonna be. And we put that on top and say, that's gonna be our price. But it turns out the cost has nothing to do with how much value you're delivering to your customer. And your customer is paying you for value, not based on your costs. So does that mean a lot of people are leaving money on the table? Cause they're like, oh, I need to make, you know, cost plus, I need to make 20% or 25% over my cost. When really their customer might pay 100% over the cost or 200% over the cost. So are people leaving money on the table if they're coming at it from that cost-based direction? Absolutely, yes. And here's how to think about that. I don't care what price you give me. If that price is not exactly equal to my willingness to pay, then one of two things is gonna happen. I'm gonna buy and I would have paid you more, in which case you left money on the table, or I'm not gonna buy because you priced higher than my willingness to pay, in which case you didn't win the deal. If you can get closer and closer to how much somebody's willing to pay, that is undoubtedly the profit maximizing price. Well, so how do we even know what they're willing to pay? I mean, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about my own business and it's like, you know, I, I know with some clients, but others, they call up and I, I do my homework. I ask them the questions and it's like, I have no idea where this is going to go. How do we, how do we even begin? Fabulous question. And so the very first thing you want to think about in terms of willingness to pay is what's the decision my buyer is making just before they're buying my product. Typically, people make two different decisions when we buy something. We first say, will I? Will I buy something in this product category? And then after we've said yes, then we go on to say, okay, which one am I going to go buy? Think about the last time you bought a new car. Right? You said, uh, am I going to buy a new car? Yep, whatever happened, it caused you to say, yes, it's time to go buy a new car. And the next thing you did is we went shopping for new cars. What are the, what's the brand I'm going to get? How am I going to trade it off? And, and so how do I make that decision? Now, what's fascinating about what I just told you is people who are making the will I decision are not price sensitive. They're not being driven by price at the moment. Something else is driving them. And as soon as they shift to the which one decision, price suddenly becomes really important. So I'm trying to decide, am I going to hire you or am I going to hire somebody else? Am I going to buy this car? Am I going to buy that car? And price is a really big trade-off decision there. But the important part of what we just talked about is sometimes people never make a which one decision. They only make a will I decision. And when people only make a will I decision, price isn't driving that decision. They're not price sensitive. If you can either build products or find situations or create situations where your customers are not choosing between you and a competitive product, raise your price 10% and demand won't change at all. It's a, it's a done deal. Now, let me give you some examples of products, if I may, that fit in the will I category. Uh, probably my all-time favorite is popcorn at the movie theater. <laughs> the, the margins on that must be huge. Oh my gosh. But did you know that you can get free popcorn at Ace Hardware? Yes, I did know that. Yes. And, and yet when you walk in the movie theater, you look up at the board, and you say, am I going to take out a mortgage today to buy popcorn or not? <laughs> <laughs> and that's because there's no competitive alternative once you've walked in the door. If you're using an Apple iPhone today, my guess is you are thinking to yourself, am I going to buy the latest and greatest iPhone or not? But what you're not thinking is, am I going to buy the new iPhone or switch to Android? And so you're essentially making a will I decision for that next iPhone, which is why Apple gets away with charging much, much higher prices, much higher margins than all of the other competitors that are building Android phones. So, so that makes a lot of sense. So, okay, so if you have something where they're going to buy it and they're not really price sensitive, there has to be a point. I mean, I'm not going to spend $32 for popcorn. I mean, where, how do you know where the cap is on that? Well, I, I'm less worried about finding the cap and more worried about you recognizing those situations. So you can just raise your price 10% and take that extra money and go home. What typically happens is we as business people 
we're so focused on, oh, I can't lose that deal. I can't lose that deal that we think price is driving everything and we're always negotiating ourselves down. The moment I know that I don't have competition in a deal, I know I never have to negotiate price, right? Maybe I'll negotiate it a little bit just to grease the wheels and get the deal to move through faster, but I don't have to give much margin. I know I'm going to win that deal. So is there a difference when you're selling a product versus when you're selling a service that doesn't have you know, specific costs? So if you're a consultant or you're a speaker or a trainer, is there a different thing you face than if you've made a widget? Uh, the answer is no in the sense that in every case, we're focused on how much value does my buyer get for what they're buying? The real difference is if you're a speaker or a consultant, especially if you're a solopreneur, you have major confidence problems because you're now <laughs> pricing yourself instead of pricing something else. And you're thinking, well, if they don't hire me, they don't like me and oh, I, gotta, I might as well go shoot myself or something, right? But that's not the case. We just need to have confidence and say, look, this is what my price is. So why do people struggle so much getting there? Why is it so hard to get to the point where they can just set their price and own it? I don't really know the answer to that question, but I'm going to give you a couple guesses. <laughs> One is we're hungry, right? We really need the next deal. And as long as I really need the next deal, it's hard for me to hold my price. So let's say I quote you some number, $10,000 for something, and, and I really need it because I haven't had a, a job in a little while. And, and you say, you know, Mark, I, I, can, I only have 5K for that. It's like, well, I'd rather have 5K than nothing. Yeah, I'll take that. That sounds good to me. And, and so it's hard because we haven't internalized our own value. And by the way, this is true in products as well. It, it just, it isn't hurting our ego if we don't win the product, if we don't win the, the sale. Because what happens is we don't understand value the way our buyers are getting value, which is us saying, well, if I don't really know it, then I'm willing to give you discounts because I'm just guessing. And you already said you'd give me 5,000, so I'll take that. I know I can win at that. But, but what if I know, right? I quote you 10,000 and I know that I'm about to make you $100,000 in profit and there's no place else you can go get it. Why would I ever discount? I would just say it's 10K, sorry, right? If you only have 5K, I understand, but it's 10K if you wanna hire me. So what happens to a company though that prices themselves out of the market and wants to hold true to it other than the fact that they don't sell anything? I mean, it's, you know, I, I see this all the time in the professional speaking business is somebody gets told, wow, you're so good. You should raise your prices too. And I'm fictitiously making up a number, $15,000. And then they, they just never get it where before at like nine, they were working a lot, uh, you know, and they're like, well, everybody said I should raise my prices. So, so what, what happens in there? What did, what did they miss? Yeah. Well, first off, it should have been a self-correcting problem as in they realized that they, they're not making it. And a nine to 15 K jump is a pretty big jump for a speaker. What I would always recommend my speakers or my solopreneurs, anybody I'm coaching in that respect do is every time you win a piece of business, it's okay to raise your price a little bit for the next piece of business. Cause you know, someone's willing to pay you nine K what about 9,500? What about 10 K? Right. What about 10, five? And when I start losing business, then I stop raising my price. That's pretty easy. And the other thing I do that's really important is when you're busy is when you raise prices. So that's actually really good advice because I've seen people make just crazy jumps based on, you know, a piece of advice somebody gave them at a conference or something like that. It's like, oh, that's a bad idea. Um, what about somebody who's new to an industry who needs to build up, you know, sort of their reputation? Do you recommend that they just come in and start at the high of where the, the, the king players are in the business? Or do you recommend that they start somewhere a little bit lower and build themselves up? You know, we haven't spent enough time talking about value. And customer perceived value is the answer to that question. If I'm coming into a new industry, the question is, can I make the buyer believe that I can deliver as much value as somebody else who's been in that industry? And, and by the way, I could make arguments that said, because I've been in all these other industries, I have more knowledge to bring into your industry. 
But I could also make the argument that says, I have no idea how you guys do business and I can't help you as well as those other people could. The real question is how well can I communicate the value that you're going to get when you hire me? All right. So I love that. How do I communicate the value? So let's say somebody has a product or a service and they've got the value. How do they communicate that to the potential client? <laughs> okay. Step one, try to figure out what it actually means, right? What value to the customer means is really hard. And I like to teach a concept I call value tables. And a value table has four columns in it. The first column is the solution. So this is a product, it's a product feature. Um, it could be either. And after you've put in some product or product feature, then I the next column is the problem. What was the problem you were solving when you built that feature? So if you say to me, these are the three best features I have. Great, let's break those down. Why did you build it? What was the problem somebody had that you said, I gotta go build this thing so that I can solve that problem? So now you find somebody, I don't care who, and you know, pick your best customers. This customer has a problem. They bought your product to solve the problem. What result, what measurable result should they expect to get? Now it's not gonna be the same for every customer, but we could write that and actually write it in as, as a numerical thing. 2% more productivity, 3% less turnover. Right? We can make it numeric. And then the last column in the B2B space, especially, I can use business acumen and help calculate what's the dollar value of that result to your company. How much more profit are you making because you achieve that result? So what types of companies hire a pricing expert? Um... Besides, <laughs> besides smart ones. Yeah, they, yeah, that's a good answer, smart ones. It, it turns out most companies need pricing help. Once you get to a relatively large size, so let's say 50 million, 100 million in revenue, those companies tend to hire their own internal pricing people. Um, and so they think they've got the problem solved. Now they may or may not, and it depends on who they hired and how well the team works. And then when you get pretty small, so down in the, you know, the 5 million range and below, it starts to get expensive to hire a pricing expert. Uh, so maybe it makes sense to hire someone like me just for a consultation, an hour to say, okay, let me talk me through this a little bit. But once you get in that, in that middle range of 10 to 50 million, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to move your revenue by 5% without a problem. And that's a huge return on investment for you. All right. I've got more questions for you, but first I have to thank the other sponsor of this episode. So this episode is brought to you by Podfly Productions. Podfly takes the time and the headache out of creating your own podcast. They set you up with the right equipment, training, and guidance so that you sound amazing. And Podfly does all the heavy lifting and that pesky technical work so that you can focus on creating great content, growing your audience, and interviewing people who are making waves in business like Mark Stiving. Hey, if you want to start a podcast, and I know, I know that some of you do, jump over to podfly.net slash cool things and check out the offer that they have for the listeners of this show. All right. So something just popped into my mind. We've talked about products. We've talked about services. But right now, I know a lot of people who are starting subscription-based services, you know, because there's all of these like online product you know, type things that everybody's got an online course. People have online groups. They do online coaching. How the heck do you price subscriptions? I've been looking at this and I don't even know where you start. Some people are pricing them at $9 a month. Some people are $9,000 a month. How do you even price a subscription versus a product or a service? Yeah, pretty fascinating uh, problem. One of the things that happens is when you've got a traditional product, my job is to get you to buy my product. And typically what happens is after you've bought my product, I deliver the product or the service to you and we're done. Thank you very much. I appreciate the check. That was awesome. Uh, in subscriptions, that's not true, right? In subscriptions, what happens is I need to get you to buy my product. So you need to subscribe to my, my world. And then I need to, you to keep paying me month after month after month. And, and I subscribe to things and then I see it on my, on my uh, credit card statement. I'm like, unsubscribe. Yeah, because you didn't realize it or you didn't realize that you weren't going to use it or 
or, or they didn't provide value. Yeah. Well, and, and so that's really the key point is in traditional business, a lot of times we have to convince you that there's value, right? And I may be able to fudge the truth, right? I may be able to trick you into buying my product. In a subscription, if I trick you into buying it, you use it for a month or two and you're like, yeah, that didn't really have value. I'm, I'm unsubscribing, right? I, I'm not really watching Apple Plus or whatever it is. I'm unsubscribing. Uh, and, and so we get to learn what the real value is to us as we make those decisions. So if we're building a subscription business, instead of managing a single revenue bucket, which is what we've always done before, we've, I got to win customers. Now I have to manage three different revenue buckets. The first one is I got to win customers. That, that one didn't change. The second one is I need to keep my customers. I keep my customers by making sure they're using my product, by making sure I'm delivering value to them. And typically uh, companies, especially SaaS type companies, created a new department called customer success. And their job is to see who's using and who's not using the product. How do they get people to use the product more? How do I get them to love us more? Because then they're less likely to churn. The third revenue bucket that you have to manage then is called grow. You need to grow your current customers. If you are doing a good job with your subscription and you get someone to, to buy into your product line, then over time, I can get you to upgrade into the next, pa next higher package. I can get you to use more and based on how I'm charging you, I might get you to pay me more because you're using more. Uh, there's lots of tricks on things that we can do to get more money from our current customers. And so those are truly three different revenue streams and three different sets of marketing uh, and sales decisions and tactics we have to make. So how do people in that world even start pricing? I mean, it seems, it seems like with those three different constituencies of, of things they need to do, I mean, where do they start? I mean, I know some people I've talked to kind of go with the low. So you just get lots of volume, lots of people, they're less likely to subscribe because who cares that it's $9 on their credit card. Uh, and other people go go the opposite opposite direction and, and price it really high. How do they how do they even figure out where that value is for a, for a service like that? Yeah, we're going to come back to the answer of value. What is the value that I'm delivering to a customer? Um, how much? What are you getting for what it is that I'm providing for you? And then you could also think about what's your corporate strategy. What are you trying to get accomplished? It may be that LinkedIn delivers me a ton of value but they only deliver me a ton of value because everybody is on LinkedIn, which is why they have a free, what's called a freemium type product. So we can all have a free LinkedIn account, mostly because they're using our data as their product, um, which is totally okay. It's a great strategy for them to use. And what we may want to do as a company is say, look, we've got these things called network effects where we need really big uh, networks and so therefore we're gonna enter at a low price. We're gonna have a free type offering so that we can build our network up quickly. And then over time, we can start to ratchet up the price as we've realized how much value we're truly delivering to our marketplace. And, and you actually see that in a lot of companies where if it's a software company and they're growing really well, they'll start out at a super low price and three or four years later, they're at a price that's 10 or 20 X what they started out at. Uh, just because they've able they've been able to prove the value of their product to the marketplace. All right, the answer to a lot of my questions has been customer perceived value, and we're, we keep going back to that that whole point of value. So before we wrap this up, what is it about value that most companies that you consult with really don't understand? Where's where's the the golden nugget here that we need every listener to walk away with? It comes back to that value table I talked about, but I'm not going to do the table. Here's what I'm going to say, really simply. Do you truly understand why your customers are buying your products? What is it that they're getting out of it? And so if you just think about the four columns I gave you, it's the problem, it's the solution, the problem, the result, and the value. In truth, just look at the center two. What's the problem they're trying to solve? What's the problem they have? Why are they going to buy your product? And what's the result they hope to achieve? If you look at your web page today, which sadly almost every company, if you go look at their web page, it's a list of features, right? That's the far left-hand column of the value table. Those are the solutions and the features. If instead of that, they were simply writing, what are all the problems we're solving and what are the results people might achieve? Suddenly we're resonating with our marketplace. 
our buyers are being able to perceive better how much value we can deliver. And it turns out we're going to learn how much value we're delivering to our customers. Because I would argue most companies really don't know how much value they deliver to their customers. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about it just from my own standpoint and, and other places that I've worked. And it's like I wrote down, you know, sell to the problems that the people have is what I actually wrote down in my own layman's language. So let's take it one step further. So if somebody's listening to this and they're like, okay, we've gone through 24 minutes. I need to do something right now to better understand my pricing and to make sure I'm in that sweet spot. What can they do today? Start talking to your customers and listening really, really hard for what are the problems they wanted to solve and what are the results, assuming they bought your product and use it, what are the results they actually achieved? Your job is to listen to their words. And, and here's the sad thing, you already think you know the answers and you're wrong. So please, please, please go in with the attitude that says, I want to be surprised. I'm truly listening. Uh, tell me something I don't know. And I guarantee you, you are going to be shocked. Um, and, and one of the, the things I love to do with customers or my clients is I'll say, give me the list of five or 10 things, the reasons people buy your product. And then if I go out and talk to a couple customers and I come back, those things aren't on the list. Like, wait, guys, we have a disconnect here. So truly go listen to your marketplace. I, I love that. And it goes back to the initial question when I said, what do you think the, the number one trade is? And you said, hey, most business people don't really think about their customers enough and what their customers are thinking. So I love the way we, we took it all back to square one with that. Any last thoughts, Mark? It, yeah, it's so funny because I think of this concept of value-based business or value-based mindset. And, and you've heard me say the word value a million times so far today. I came at this because I'm a pricing expert and I want to know how people choose to buy products and they choose based on value. But as soon as you start thinking that way, shouldn't salespeople start understanding how to communicate value one on one with customers? Shouldn't marketing people start understanding how to find people who get the most value from our products and filling the funnel? Shouldn't our product development people be building products that truly have value to our marketplace because they understand what value is? I believe wholeheartedly that value should drive your entire business. All right. Everybody's heard that. Value should be driving every aspect of your business. Mark, if somebody wants to find you and they want to learn about your company, Impact Pricing, how do they do that? Uh, the easy thing is impactpricing.com. We're, we're there. And then find me on LinkedIn. I, I'm very active there and I, I blog. I podcast. I put out tons of free content. Come follow me. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being a guest here on Making Waves at Sea level I think you probably perked some people up that they got to go in and make some waves in their pricing policies. All right. Thank you to everybody who tuned in and listened. You know, I say it every single episode. If it wasn't for the audience, why would I do this show? It's really because I started the show as a way just to get to meet some cool people like Mark and to be able to share that. And now seven years later, we're still going strong. So do me a favor. Make sure you tell your friends about making waves at sea level. When I talk to somebody who listens to the show, I always say, how did you find this podcast? And I'm almost 100% of the time they said word of mouth. Their mom, their brother, their boss, their neighbor said, hey, you like business. You should listen to the show. So make sure you're telling a friend, yes, I would love you to jump over to Apple or Stitcher or Spotify and leave one of those reviews that says best podcast ever. But more important, go tell a friend. Now go out there, flex your business muscles. Make sure that you're paying attention to what your customers are saying when you're pricing your product so that you know the value that you're giving. Make sure your career ladder is against the correct wall because you don't want to climb a career ladder only to find it was in the wrong place because that sucks. And then finally, while you're out there doing all this stuff, have some fun along the way. Have a great day.